welcome. Thank you, ladies, for coming in, staying late, whatever you're doing for um, this presentation. Paul has asked me to speak to the staff today about how you code ADL assistance that you provide. You need me louder? Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> well, well, usually people don't need me louder. <laughs> um, you, how you code the ADLs in the computer is important to the facility in a number of ways. And a lot of times the STNAs don't realize how important their documentation really is. And today we're just going to go over just about how you guys code bed mobility, toileting, transfers, and eating. Those are the four plates that we ask you to answer in, in the key up, or in the computer screen, right? Those four areas under ADLs, bed mobility, toileting, transfers, and eating. So we're going to go over the ADL coding to make sure that you guys understand what are you coding, how are you coding it, and what kind of an impact it can have on, on the resident and on the facility. So we already talked about the four areas of ADLs that affect how much the facility gets reimbursed for every resident is how the patient moves in bed or if they sleep in a chair. Have you ever had patients that just sleep up in a chair? That includes residents that sleep in a recliner. Okay, so if they only want to sleep in their lazy boy chair, that's fine. You will still code bed mobility for how they sleep in that chair. Um, sometimes we have STNAs that say, well, I put that it didn't happen because they were never in the bed. Well, that's incorrect. We have to code what they do in that recliner if that's where they sleep as part of bed mobility. Okay? Toileting, transfers, and how the patient eats. Okay? Um, <clears throat> we ask every day that the STNA staff at Maple Hill Communities code what level of assistance that patient needs and how many of you, how many aids it took to get that task accomplished, right? When you go through your screens, it asks you first what level of assistance did the patient need and then how many staff members did it take to do that task. Um, it's not about what the resident should have needed. Well, he's able to do it on his own. Most of the time, he's able to do it on his own. And today, I don't know what happened, so I'm just going to code him like he is every other day. No. You code for the amount of assistance you had to provide on your shift, regardless of whether or not that's what the resident needed. Have you ever had a resident who you know darn good and well can get themselves in and out of the bed? They do it all the time, especially when we're not looking, right? But then you go in to take care of them, and that evening they say, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. Now, whether or not they're truly weak, they're ill, or they just behaviorally don't want to do it, if you have to provide more assistance for that patient at that moment, that's what you code for. Regardless of if the rest of the time you've coded them differently, if today on today's shift or tonight on tonight's shift, you have to provide more care for that resident, then that's what you code. Okay? That's not doing anything inappropriate. That's not coding heavy or saying that the patient needed more than they, than they got. That's saying you delivered that type of care for that shift for that patient. Um, and it's extremely important that you code these issues accurately. And I'm going to show you why that is in just a few minutes. Okay? So for anybody that's coding in the computer that they are providing levels of assistance with ADLs to the resident, you've got to understand what the difference is. How many people think, by show of hands, that you understand what it means if someone's totally independent with something? We, everybody, they, right, they pretty much get what independent means, right? You had to do nothing for that patient. And most people understand what it means to be totally dependent, right? What does totally dependent mean to you? They can't do anything. They can't do anything. You had to do everything, absolutely. So we're real good with those two definitions. It's when we get into the, the muddy waters of supervision, limited assistance, and extensive assistance. And I've had STNAs that will stand at, at, at Maple Knoll, they have the kiosks on the wall. You guys have the computers at, at your old cubbies that you document on. But I've had people standing at their computer screens saying, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not clear on what these are, what these other three mean. So we're going to make sure you're clear on that this morning. So you guys were right. Independent means the staff had to do nothing. That includes you didn't even have to go in and verbally tell them 
to do something. They did it all on their own. They were able to get themselves up, get their teeth brushed, get their hair brushed, and get themselves ready for breakfast. You did nothing. You might have said good morning to them. Hopefully you went in and introduced yourself that you were there for the evening or you were there for the day, correct? But you had to do nothing else with them. They do their own routine, okay? Supervision is where you have had to do something with either your eyes or your mouth. You've either had to, as you're walking by that patient's room, you've had to eyeball and make sure that they were working on what you asked them to do, or you had to say, Mrs. Smith, I need for you to make sure that you get up and you start doing your morning care. Once you've had to tell them, or you've had to witness them, you've now supervised them. Okay? That's a big difference from independent, isn't it? And a lot of people code independent when they've really supervised that resident with either their eyes or their mouth. People don't think that the fact that you had to cue you to do something and then you went ahead and did it, that that was supervision. They are coding that as independent. And that's not independent. You've had to supervise them. Okay? So remember, no touching. You put no hands on the resident, no hands on their equipment. You did not have to get anything out of the drawer for them. You just, supervision is eyes or mouth. You watched to make sure they were getting it done, or you verbally had to cue them to do it, or verbally had to cue them through the process. Okay, does that make sense? Let's go to limited assistance. Limited assistance means you had to put your hands on something. Their equipment, you had to get their equipment out for them. You had to put your the hands on you had to put your hands on the resident to guide their limbs. Let's say you have and we're taking care of a patient with Parkinson's and they tremor, right? They shake. And sometimes you have to put your hand on top of their hand that's shaking to get it to stop so that they can eat without spilling it, right? Maybe you have to put your hand on top of their hand if they're holding a cup to make sure that they don't spill as they're taking it to their mouth. Okay? You have your hand on top of their hand. That's limited assistance. So you've gotten out the supplies for them and you have had to hold their hand while they brush their teeth, hold their hand while they eat, help them get dressed, buttoning things up. That's limited assistance. And the, the big thing to remember with limited assistance is you did something hands-on, but you did not bear their weight. You weren't helping their muscles with your muscles. Okay, does that make sense? You're putting your hands on them, but you're not bearing their weight. They're getting up from the toilet, and you've got your gait belt on them, and you're holding their gait belt, but they're able to get up. You're not using any of your muscles. You're just holding onto their gait belt while they get up to make sure that they're okay. That's limited assistance. Extensive assistance changes, and you will code this when you are using your arm muscles or your leg muscles to help that patient. You are bearing some of their weight. So this goes from hand on top to now hand on bottom. Do you see how when my hand is on the top, it's not bearing any weight? But when you go under the bottom, it is. So when you've gone from steadying someone's hand while they're eating this way, which is limited assistance, to holding their hand under here to keep them steady, you're now bearing their weight. You're going to feel extensive assist in your arms or in your legs, maybe in your back a little bit. You ever had a patient that can get themselves down onto the toilet? They can sit themselves down onto the toilet, but boy, don't we have a lot of problems getting off? Oh, I'm, I'm getting to that point. <laughs> you have a little more problem getting up than you have getting down. And you have to now what? When they get down, you don't really have to do any more than hold on to their gait belt. But when they're getting up, you have to do this, don't you? You know if you're going to bear somebody's weight, partial weight or full weight, you have to do what? Bend at your knees as proper body mechanics. When you start doing that, that's extensive assist. And this is where most people undercode as an STNA. They don't give credit for the amount of extensive assistance that you're providing. 
Can you think about any instances where you may not have coded correctly, given these definitions? I can tell you I would have. I was an aide for four years. I can tell you I would have. We didn't have this coding then, but absolutely. It's an aide 30 years ago. <clears throat> Total dependence is the patient did not participate at all. And as we said, said earlier, most people understand what total dependence is. You had to do everything. Okay? So also important when you're coding your ADLs, once you get past the limited, or the, whether they're limited assistance or extensive assistance or independent or supervised or totally dependent, you have to say how many people did it take to complete that task, right? Did it take one of you or did it take you and me to do this? If it took you and me to do this, we need to code that, right? So how many times have you actually, and especially working on night shift, and I work night shifts, how many times did you get a buddy with you to go in there and help pull somebody up in bed? It happens all the time, doesn't it? There are very, very few patients that are able to pull themselves up in bed by themselves or with one aid. Our patients are getting heavier. They're sicker. They're weaker. It's very difficult for them to even be able to put their feet flat on the mattress to be able to help push themselves up, right? So how many times do you go into a room and use two people to help pull somebody up in bed when they've scooched down to the bottom of the mattress? Pretty often? More often than you probably think about? Mm -hmm. Now that you think about it, you're like, gosh, yeah, I really do that a lot. And are you coding that you only did it? Or are you coding that two people did it? It doesn't matter whether the patient needed it. That's not what you're coding. What you're coding is how many people did it. Okay. So if you go in there and you're walking down the hallway and you see me and you say, KP, I need some help pulling somebody up in bed because you want to do it safely, because you don't want to drag them across the sheets, because you don't want to shear their skin, and you don't want to hurt yourself, and you use me to help you lift, then you're going to document in your computer that it took two people for bed mobility. Okay. Do you guys realize that we get a higher level of reimbursement when you use two people versus one? So if you use two people, you need to document. And now let me be perfectly clear. I'm not telling you to use two people every time to get higher reimbursement. I am not telling you that. Let's just make sure we're perfectly crystal clear on that. What I'm telling you is if you need to use two, then you document that you use two. Okay. <clears throat> so I want you to keep that information in your minds as you guys are sitting there at your computers during the night or during the day and documenting for this resident what level of assistance they took. And I gave you a separate sheet that has the ADL definitions. At Maple Knoll, we have these laminated and put by the aid screens where they have to document so that it's right there visually for them to help cue them as to how they need to document so that they understand the definitions and they're there at all times for them to see them. You guys have them in your books. They're laminated in your books. Mm -hmm. um, and what you, as an STNA code in the computer screens, I want you to be crystal clear that you understand that this is part of the legal record. This goes with the patient's chart. If the patient's chart needs to go to any type of a legal entity, an insurance company, Medicare, Medicaid, your documentation is important. It supports the reimbursement that we get back for the residents. And if we are um, coding accurately in the computers the level of, of assistance that you need to provide, then we're care planning accurately, we're coding MDSs accurately, because that's all based on the, the input we get back from your documentation in the computer. So if you're coding that they need less of a level of assistance than what they really need, then the care plan will not be correct and the MDS will not be correct. And that puts us at an increased risk for deficiencies with the state survey. Okay? Because if I'm a surveyor and I come in and I witness you always using two people to pull someone up in bed, and I look at the MDS and the care plan, and the MDS and the care plan says only one person. Well, I'm going to come speak with you. And I'm going to interview you as the surveyor. And I'm going to ask, 
what, did, was today the only day that they needed two persons? And you're going to tell me what? No, I need to use two people all the time because they're very tired at night and I always have to use two people. That surveyor now has a reason to give us a deficiency for not coding an MDS correctly, not care planning accurately. So what you guys do is important. So let's talk about if you've miscoded this. If you've completely gone through there and you've coded somebody incorrectly. So what's the big deal? What's the big deal? It's a couple of patients. I've only got 10 patients. What's the big deal? If I decided I just didn't code it correctly tonight, what can happen? How does that impact anybody? So let me give you this example. You guys enter in your information on a patient for the bed mobility, transfers, toileting, and eating. Okay? We've got your coding in there. The resident is also on oxygen. Ever taken care of somebody with the oxygen? Of course you have. Okay? So they've also used oxygen. Now, what you need to know is that based on each resident's clinical condition, that groups them into a, reim a reimbursement category okay, for payment to this facility. So can you understand that if a patient has IVs, they're pretty, they've got a lot going on, right? They're medically pretty acutely ill. We're going to be reimbursed more for the patients that are more critically ill than for the patients that maybe just have some behavior problems or are wandering. Or maybe just here, you know, they, they need a little bit more assistance with ADLs, but they really don't have anything clinically going on with them. So there's an entire group of categories of where a patient will group based on their acuity level or how sick they are, what kind of needs they have. So if you have oxygen as a patient, that's going to put you into a category called clinically complex. So let's say the STNA did not document accurately the care that was provided to that resident. They undercoded. They didn't put when they used two people. They didn't put, they put limited assistance when he really was extensive assistance with toileting. Okay. Because remember, if you if somebody gets onto the toilet by themselves, but you have to bear their weight to get them up, that person's extensive assistance. Okay. Let's say you only put limited assistance. And how you code the ADLs helps group residents into subcategories within every clinical category. So when you guys code someone for ADLs, they're given a number score based on the answers you put in. That number score will group them into a subgroup in each clinical category. So if you undercode that resident, if you don't code correctly, they're going to group lower. Does that make sense? They're going to group in the lower reimbursement categories. So let's say on this particular example with this person with oxygen, they're in a clinically complex category, but because you didn't code them accurately, they're going to go into a group that gives us $307 a day reimbursement. Okay. This is based on 2012. I gotta go. Okay. Um, $307 per day. Okay. Had you coded correctly, they would have been grouped into the better category that gives us $325 per day. So what's that big deal? It's not just about the dollars. They were coded inaccurately that put them in the lower category. The, the resident care guide's not going to be accurate, right? Because that shows what you tell us they need. The resident plan of care is not going to be accurate. And between $307 a day, where they were coded inaccurately, or $325 a day, when they were coded correctly, that's an $18 a day difference. If you multiply that times that patient being in here 365, 365 days a week, rather, we have lost $6,570 for that one patient because they were coded inaccurately. Now that makes a big deal, doesn't it? So you need to make sure that you learn your ADL coding. You need to refer to those definitions. Paul said that they are in a laminated sheet in a book by your computer terminals. Make sure that you know those. Make sure that you complete all your documentation timely. And if you have any questions, please see your MDS nurse for clarifications. If you have any questions as to where, what definition of an ADL assistance someone would fall into, or talk to Paul, and he will be more than happy to help you clarify that. Any questions? All right, thank you very much for your time.